I am really happy to welcome Mickey Edwards, Elaine Hagopian, Jeffrey Taliaferro, and Barbara McDougall for this exploration of U.S. foreign policy. Wherever you may stand on the topic, I really believe that you will find our guests to be both insightful and thought-provoking. Thanks to Valerie Epps and Suffolk University Law School for accommodating us here in this great space. Many thanks also to Professor Melissa Hausman of the Government Department here at Suffolk. She's been a great help in coordinating this event, and it is she who will now get things rolling with an introduction of our esteemed moderator. Thanks all very much. Here we go. Thanks very much, Tom. It's my honor to introduce our moderator, the Honorable Barbara McDougall, who flew, I believe, from Calgary to be here tonight. She is an honors graduate of the University of Toronto with a BA in both political science and economics. She's a chartered financial analyst and was a key member of the Mulroney Progressive Conservative Government in Canada from 1984 to 1993. In fact, she was a key hand on the ship of state through those years, we might say. She served in successive portfolios, including Minister for the Status of Women, uh, Associate Minister for Finance, um, Employment and Immigration, as well as being Secretary of State for External Affairs from 91 to 93. So we're very pleased to be able to have her here tonight. And without further ado, I will turn it over. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. I'm delighted to be here at this very distinguished university at your invitation and uh, with this um, uh, group of distinguished scholars to my left here. I don't know whether that's metaphorically or just physically, but uh, uh, I am very pleased to be in such distinguished company. Um, I, I'm a political Practitioner, I know that Mickey Edwards uh, was as well, and I don't know whether his reincarnation as a scholar, um, uh, uh, that puts him on another level. Because those of us who are political practitioners, uh, it is always awesome, um, to use a contemporary word in its traditional sense, to hear what academics and experts and scholars have to say on the topic of the state of the world and foreign policy. I do not regard myself as an expert, but I have been fortunate to have benefited from the advice of experts and academics. And uh, I'm sure that the uh, congressman will agree that those of us who are in practical politics uh, should pay a lot of attention to academics and scholars and experts because they're the ones who keep you out of, a trub out of trouble and make you sound like more of an expert than you really are. Now, the purpose of that message is a sermon to all the students here, and that is pay attention to the experts, uh, including the ones that stand in front of you every day in the classroom because they do actually know something. And uh, you're surrounded with such great opportunities with the scholars in this school that uh, my, my one word of advice to all of you, uh, whatever else you may do, do pay attention to these wonderful experts that you have at uh, your uh, disposal. Now, I am uh, going to talk, uh, I'm not part of the panel, but I am going to talk briefly about Canada, um, very briefly about Canada. I will not insult you by asking you if you know where it is, uh, although there are many who don't. But I am going to ask you, how many of you know that Canada is the new cool? You don't know that, do you? It says so. The Economist, latest edition. For those of you who can't see, it's a moose wearing sunglasses. And on the inside, it says, quote, a cautious case can be made that Canada is now rather cool. Unquote. Now, there's a ringing endorsement, if ever I heard one. <laughs> but it is certainly a lot more, uh, uh, more uh, attention of that kind than Canada's used to getting. Cool or not, Canada's role in the world, while modest, is one that we are very proud of. We are not a country of our size, active on every file, although sometimes we seem to act like we are. 
But Canada has been able to translate its modest size into occasional positions of influence. Canada was the country that founded and shaped peacekeeping during the Suez Crisis and won a Nobel Prize for it. We played a leading role in bringing an end to apartheid in South Africa. Uh, at the end of World War II, we were the world's third largest navy. Today, we're helping to lead the way in fighting AIDS in Africa. We led the way in establishing an international criminal court and in bringing forth a treaty to ban landmines. We remain by far the largest trading partner of the United States. We shared your grief at the time of the terrorist attacks and fed and housed over 35,000 Americans whose planes were diverted directly following the attacks into very tiny northern communities. We share a common concern for security at our perimeter, and we know that our security is intertwined with yours. Whatever our differences, and there are many, we share a common history. Both of us are multicultural societies that are creatures of the new world. For these and other reasons, I am always happy to visit and share a platform like this, and I always have something to learn, sometimes to explore common concerns and sometimes to argue from a different perspective. Tonight, I look forward to a lively discussion, and particularly to your questions on what in the world are we going to do, we being, in this case, you. Uh, our distinguished panelists are going to muse on this role from a variety of perspective. They will each have 15 minutes uh, to uh, talk about their positions, and uh, then we will go to questions and comments from the floor. And we're going to start with Mickey Edwards, who is the John Quincy Adams uh, Lecturer in Legislative Politics at the Kennedy School of Government at that other university, um, and he has considerable experience politically. He was a congressman for 16 years. He has served as a co-chair of a joint Brookings Institute Council, uh, Institution Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on International Affairs, and he's the author of three books. He writes a weekly newspaper column. Uh, and is therefore widely known for his commentary on some of these issues. He's going to lead us off by talking about the principles of U.S. foreign policy and uh, uh, where the Bush government uh, does or does not fit into that, um, uh, into that structure, and he will be our introductory speaker. Mr. Edwards. Uh, thanks, Barbara. I, I actually didn't know until now that I was going to be talking about where the Bush administration fits into that. So, you know, maybe that will come in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, first of all, I apologize. The reason I'm first is it's punishment because I, I was late. I taught until 6 o'clock uh, and got here a few minutes late. And so for making all of you wait, I have to do this. Uh, having just left the classroom, I, I, you know, Barbara, if you could come to my class and, and tell them they're supposed to pay attention, it would be really terrific. Uh, the, uh, uh, I actually spend a lot of time thinking about Canada because of my friend Kim Campbell, who's also uh, at the school. Uh, so we, we appreciate having uh, Canada to, is it the north? Is it the north of us? <laughs> yes, well. It's the other way from Mexico. All oh, right, okay. Well, you know, first of all, I want to I I thank uh, you all and Susan and Tom and all for, for letting us participate in this forum because the uh, degree to which foreign policy is, is either higher or lower on the scale of public interest, you know, comes and goes from time to time. But right now it's obviously, you know, a major issue in the country and something that's on everybody's minds. Uh, and I want to commend both uh, the Ford Hall Forum uh, and the law school for letting us uh, do this here, for, for letting us uh, take part uh, in this topic. So the, the question that we've been given 
uh, is what in the world should we do? What action should we take? Uh, we, again, uh, being uh, the U.S. government. I, I think to answer that, we have to go back to an even more fundamental and basic question. Uh, because what we should do in any particular instance is very much predicated on the answer to the more basic question of what is it that we are trying to achieve? What is the goal that we're striving uh, for? So it's, it's not what is the goal in Iraq or in North Korea or in the Middle East or the goal in the year 2003, but what is the goal, the consistent goal of American foreign policy in every age and in every situation? What is the purpose of a national foreign policy? What are the criteria that you should use in determining when to act, where to act, and how to act? So I want to address uh, some of that, some, some of that uh, question. Uh, and I, I want to suggest, first of all, that the primary purpose of a nation's foreign policy I'm not saying the primary purpose of America's foreign policy. The primary purpose of any nation's foreign policy is simply to ensure or to enhance the physical and economic security of that nation's citizens. There will always be legitimate debate about how one should act in order to provide that security which actions are right or wrong, which, which help it and which hurt it, whether the policies that, put, that are put forth serve those purposes. Uh, but that's the bottom line. You start out, the reason you have a foreign policy in any country is to secure the interests, including the defense interests and the economic interests of that country. During my own years as a member of Congress, uh, that debate took place very often over the formulation of our policies uh, concerning the Middle East, Nicaragua and El Salvador, the Panama Canal, Turkey, Greece and Cyprus, Israel and Egypt, South Africa, the American bases in the Philippines, authorization of the first Gulf War. This is an issue that comes up over and over and over again in the history of any uh, nation. And those are debates that were emotional and that were difficult and in which honorable people on both sides held very different views as to what policies and what actions served the American interest and what actions that we took harmed American interest. And we're talking about either long-term or short-term. So start with, even though security of the American people is not our only goal, it is the first goal. So that raises a, a very important question, I think, that came up in the days that were leading up to our current involvement in Iraq. It was frequently noted by many people, and you didn't have to be a genius to note it, that a good many governments in the world did not agree with the decision to send American troops into Iraq. Uh, and many of the people who supported that decision, supported the decision in the United States to go into Iraq, were quite upset with the failure of the French, the Germans, the Russians, uh, and others not to take part uh, in that effort and not to support that effort. In, in my view, that was not, in fact, a fair criticism. The French, Germans, Russians, Chinese, and others, as well as all other members of the United Nations, have their own foreign policy purposes. And their, par their purposes, legitimately and properly, are not to follow the, the lead of the United States, but to serve the best interests of their own people uh, as they see them. And, and France, Germany, and Russia, for example, were all very deeply involved economically with Saddam Hussein. One, one, it was an important part of their economic uh, position. One could not fairly demand that the United States should do what it thought was the best course in pursuit of its own interests and simultaneously complain if other nations did the same thing. So I thought that was unfair. But conversely, it was equally unfair to suggest, I believe, as some may have felt, that the actions the United States took should depend on the approval of other nations. No president in the history of the United States of either political party would have ever agreed to allow decisions 
that he felt important to the national security to be dependent upon the approval of others. Even those countries like Germany, which are bound by their own constitutions to give great weight to international law, are not likely to allow other nations to block them from acting in ways that they think are important to their national defense or their vital national interests. You always hope that other countries will find what you're doing pleasing, that they will agree with what you're doing. But the foreign policy of any nation is established to serve the citizens of that nation. Uh, and that, uh, uh, of course, whether or not what we do serves that purpose is legitimate uh, grounds for disagreement. That raises the question of presidential and legislative obligation. One may legitimately, and many people do, question the current president's decision to take military action against Iraq and the decision by the Congress to provide the necessary agreement to that action. Legitimate areas of disagreement. But I just want to raise this, this point. After the attack on September 11, 2001, a great many people in this country demanded to know how such a thing could have been permitted to happen. Why was the government asleep? Why did we not know that there was a serious threat? And if we knew, why did we not do whatever was necessary to prevent that attack? So you have a similar question in regard to the current involvement in Iraq. One may debate, legitimately debate, whether or not the threat posed by Saddam Hussein was real and imminent. Great deal of, of uh, disagreement over that. President Clinton's national security advisor, Sandy Berger, in February of 1998, said of Saddam, quote, he will use those weapons of mass destruction again, as he has 10 times since 1983. President Clinton's Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, said in November of 1999 that, quote, Hussein has chosen to spend his money on weapons of mass destruction. Senator Carl Levin, a liberal Democrat from Michigan, said in September of 2002, quote, Saddam is building weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them. And Senator Hillary Clinton said in October of 2002, quote, Saddam has worked to rebuild his chemical and biological weapons stock, his missile delivery capability, and his nuclear program, end quote. Well, they may have been wrong, and, and President Bush may in fact be wrong uh, about whether or not the weapons were there and whether or not uh, Saddam was prepared to use them. And if President Bush did in fact act on faulty information, and I don't know, I haven't been over there, uh, uh, if he acted on faulty information, he sent American troops into Iraq, a number of them have died, uh, that's grounds for some legitimate and very serious questioning about his decision-making and the information he had. But I would also want to suggest that if the President of the United States believed that he had grounds, sufficient intelligent grounds, to believe that those threats were real, as did many of the people I've just quoted, uh, and knew of that danger and did not act to remove the threat, that might have been grounds for impeachment. So th th this is sort of the box that a public figure finds himself into. Well, another point. There are those who argued, and this is a fair point, that the United States should have merely pursued a policy of containment. It is the view of the current administration, however, and many other foreign policy experts, that containment has not, for a variety of reasons, been a workable policy for quite a long time. America's containment policy toward the Soviet Union did help prevent a war, but it did not contain communism, which continued to expand throughout Asia and Africa for many years after Ambassador Kennan formulated the strategy of containment. In the end, what happened was, and I, I thought about these professors, uh, and I know we're supposed to you know, pay a lot of attention to them, but the professors at my own school who kept writing articles about why aren't we you know, sticking to our policy of containment, and I want to say we gave it up you know, in 1980 because the United States supplanted the containment strategy with a new strategy called rollback. That was a strategy of proactive engagement that was designed not to contain the threat but to diminish it 
and ultimately to remove it. So that was the predicate for the decision that President Bush made in regard to Iraq. So let me wrap up this. That's the problem. Faced with a variety of threats to world stability, from Saddam, from al-Qaeda, from North Korea, in the Middle East, what should we do? Well, one thing we obviously want to do in pursuit of our national security is to create a more stable world. The world, and, and you could argue whether we've made it more stable or less so, but the world into which the United States sent troops in this latest engagement was not in any sense a stable world. Violence and hatred continue to roil the Middle East. North Korea is threatening to build nuclear weapon capability. Europe is still struggling with questions of its very identity, whether national or continental. The Republic of China and the People's Republic of China continue to engage in activities that threaten to lead to war in Asia. Uh, supporters of the Bush policy in Iraq, will argue that the end result in Iraq will be a more democratic, less threatening Iraq that can help ensure greater stability in the Middle East, and that engaging other Asian countries in dealing with North Korea will help to stabilize that situation. We don't know yet whether that hope's going to become a reality. We don't know whether what we've done will increase the instability. The jury is still out on that. But the gamble by the administration has been that money spent on ironically, if you remember the last presidential election, that money spent on nation building will help to bring both stability and democracy to regions where both have been uh, in short supply. I think that our foreign policy has to have at least two components. The first is to act on our own if necessary, but with others ideally, to prevent further attacks on America and the American people. That's the principal obligation of, of government. I would also suggest that action should be military in nature only when non-military means will not suffice. I think it is the judgment of the administration and of most foreign policy experts that despite the fact that President Clinton was on the verge of an airstrike against Korean facilities, the situation in Korea can be dealt with by non-military means, which is why Iraq and Korea have been dealt with in different ways. This is the second track and the final point that I, I would make. The second track I would advocate is a much greater degree of attention to helping third world nations achieve economic independence, to helping with the promotion of democracy and human rights, and removing the causes of frustration and anger, which too often finds itself directed at the richest guy in the block. The United States made decisions, real politic decisions during the Cold War, to support regimes that were non-democratic, that were repressive, and that had earned the hatred of their own people. And because we supported those regimes in Iran, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, in the Philippines, and so on, that hatred became turned on us as the people who kept their oppressors in power. So part of the answer to the future is to be alert to danger, attempt to head it off before Americans are killed, as they were at the World Trade Center. But another part of the answer is to dip into America's great wealth to help build a free and prosperous world in which the people of other lands can become our peers, our customers, our suppliers, and our friends. So I'll stop there and wait for the general discussion. Well, I think that's uh, got us off to a good start, and there's certainly lots of food for thought that we'll come back to at the end. Our next speaker is Elaine Hagopian, who is Professor Emerita of Sociology at Simmons College. And uh, she is a specialist in the Middle East and uh, also is a much-published uh, author and has done a, a great deal of work on the Palestinian situation, among others. I think she's going to talk to us about that tonight, although I'm afraid to say because when I say what she's going to talk to, she may talk about something else like Mickey did. Uh, but I think uh, uh, this will be a very topical discussion, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say, Elaine. Uh, thanks, Barbara. I... Uh, I'm an academic, and uh, all the rest are academics, but I'm the kind of academic that uh, can't usually uh, cover uh, an issue like Palestine and U.S. foreign policy in 15 minutes. 
Usually I uh, tell people um, that I'm oblivious and I don't respond very well to people who try to cut me off. Uh, but I think Tom uh, has indicated he will cut me off and Barbara is going to be the instrument. Uh, I would like to, uh, on a personal note, like to dedicate my talk to uh, a friend who died recently, two friends who died recently, uh, Dr. Edward Said and uh, Dr. Evelyn Manconi. Um, so let me begin. Uh, in 1967, Israel conquered and occupied the Palestinian West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, which constitute, as you know, 22% of what was pre-1948 Palestine. This completed the Israeli conquest of all of pre-1948 Palestine. U.S. foreign policy on Palestine has focused since 1967 on the 22%. Significant sectors of Israeli society claim it as part of Eretz Israel, or Greater Israel. Palestinians claim it for a Palestinian state. Israel has 400,000 illegal settlers there and has expanded and annexed East Jerusalem. The issue for Israel is how to retain the territories, or most of them, without absorbing into Israel the 3.5 million Palestinians living there. The issues for Palestinians are how to end Israeli occupation, vacate the settlements, uh, and establish a viable state on that 22%. I'm leaving aside for the moment the central problem of Palestinian refugees. Bush's policy regarding the Palestinian-Israeli conflict differs somewhat from previous administrations. How? First, the conflict is not central to Middle East stability. Two, resolution of it is not rooted through Jerusalem, but Baghdad. Three, on the insistence of Israel Sharon and the neocons, <clears throat> the Bush demanded regime change in the Palestinian Authority. That is, Arafat must be removed from power. He was not to be a negotiator. Uh, four, Bush accepted Sharon's uh, basic uh, onslaught into the uh, occupied territories at the beginning of the Intifada, and, um, and has accepted that under the umbrella of the war on terrorism and has tolerated, in spite of anemic criticism, the Israeli uh, fence, wall, barrier, uh, whatever you want to call it, penning in Palestinians in the West Bank. In contrast, Bush committed himself verbally to a viable Palestinian state, although its geographic dimensions were not articulated, but clearly it would not be on the 22%. He called the Israeli occupation, all of the 22% rather, he called the Israeli occupation by its right name, an occupation. In short, the Bush policy is contradictory, positive symbolically, destructive and inhuman in reality. It is both a break from the past policy, never really just in any case, and a continuation of it, which I will elucidate shortly. Over the years, there were many proposals to resolve the Palestinian-Arab-Israeli conflict. The effort that set the precedent uh, for Madrid-Oslo came during the Carter administration. <clears throat> Carter brokered a 1978 peace treaty between Egypt, Sadat, and Israel's Begin at Camp David I. The other Camp David I document, a framework for peace in the Middle East, encompassing the Palestinians and the territories, was actually dead in the water. Begin insisted on offering limited autonomy for Palestinians and the territories, while the land and its resources and Palestinian political and economic life would remain under Israeli authority. Autonomy was seen as the way to keep the land without absorbing the unwanted Palestinians into Israel as citizens. And I'm going to claim that this pattern of, of focusing on autonomy, even when later they called it a state, is the precedent that was set for later, uh, right up to the present roadmap. <clears throat> Excuse me. Following the 1991 Gulf War and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Bush Sr. felt the time was opportune to finish off the destabilizing Palestinian problem uh, on terms favorable to Israel and to consolidating American interest in the area. The Madrid-Oslo peace process got underway October 31, 1991. The legal framework for that process was the murky-worded United Nations Security Council Resolution 242, Nonetheless, Prime Minister Yustak Shamir insisted in a letter to Secretary Baker that the Camp David I framework for Middle East peace must be the actual framework since Begin's dependent autonomy uh, plan was embedded in it. 
The Madrid process failed because the Palestinian delegation from the territories insisted that Israel admit it is an occupying power. Israel refused, and it has always denied that it is an occupying power. Uh, Israel refused as it would subject Israel to international law, leading eventually to withdrawal from the territories. The delegation refused to accept the offer of dependent autonomy in the territories. Fast forward to Oslo. Arafat, as head of an emasculated PLO, did not insist on identifying Israel as an occupying power at the secret Oslo uh, agreements and negotiations. And this is why, of course, he became the negotiator. The Gaza-Jericho First Agreement, signed by him after the September 1993 Declaration of Principles, de facto conceded to Israel the right, and I put in quotes, uh, to determine on what land area it would allow Palestinian autonomy. Prime Minister Barak's mythical generous offer at Camp David II in July 2000, while settlements were being built apace, was nothing more than glorified autonomy on four non-contiguous enclaves being called a state. Even Arafat, who had compromised Palestinian rights throughout the Oslo process, was unable to sign on to the Barak Clinton dictated settlement. Oslo collapsed in 2000. The Second Intifada broke out in September 2000. However, even while the Oslo process seemed to some that it was making headway in the 1990s, the neocons, who are presently in the Bush administration, were already hatching what was to become the Bush Jr. doctrine after 2001, including their vision for the Middle East. In the 1996, uh, the neocons, whose well-known commitment to the Israeli Likud party, sent a report written by Pearl, Faith and others, uh, the neocons, to then incoming Israeli Likud uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu entitled, A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm. Recognizing that Israel early on as a state identified three Arab states, Egypt, Iraq, and Syria, as potential deterrents to its goals in the Middle East. The report spelled out a Middle East strategy for Israel. Egypt had already been removed from the deterrent equation by the 1978 Camp David I peace treaty with Israel, but Iran has since been added. They recommended to Netanyahu that he give up the Oslo Comprehensive Peace, which was to include agreements with the PLO, Syria, and Lebanon, and based on a land for peace uh, idea, to change it to a strategy of peace for peace, essentially meaning uh, you stop uh, resisting and we'll uh, give you peace. Uh, Israel, they said, should change the nature of its relations with the Palestinians, including upholding the right of hot pursuit into all Palestinian areas and nurturing alternatives to Arafat. This was 1996. Sharon's present stated desire to remove Arafat is not new. It is part of the Israeli right's desire to, uh, to quickly stop and reverse Oslo, inadequate as it was in the first place. The neocons stated to Netanyahu, and I quote, Israel can shape its strategic environment by weakening, containing, and even rolling back uh, Syria. This effort should focus on removing Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq, an important Israeli strategic objective in its own rights, the report went on, as a means of foiling Syria's regional ambitions, end of quote. It also called for action against Iran, uh, support of, of Hezbollah for its support of Hezbollah. And in 1998, of course, they wrote to Clinton and asked him to intervene uh, in Iraq, and he didn't bite on that. After his election as prime minister in 2001, the same year as Bush's presidency, Sharon sought to destroy the structural and institutional edifice of autonomy created in the territories during the Oslo years. Oh, three minutes. Well, forget that. <laughs> Uh, however, he was stuck with the Palestinian Authority and the territories resulting from Oslo and international support for a Palestinian state. He announced that he would only grant Palestinians approximately 42% of the West Bank with some attributes of sovereignty and, ox and oxymoron, but not a state. The present security fence wall, so forth, is part and parcel of that effort. Directly after 9-11, Bush called for a Palestinian state, which gave the impression that he understood the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to be a core Arab-Muslim grievance requiring American attention. 
Uh, and then he had uh, Secretary Powell make this announcement on November 19, uh, 201, um, that saying that uh, US, the U.S. supports two-state solution and that the U.S. will stay engaged. That lasted about two seconds. Uh, immediately, Sharon and his supporters here and in and out of government got Bush to embrace their view of the Israeli onslaught in the occupied territories as part and parcel of the war on terrorism. Palestinian resistance to Israeli occupation and settler colonization was defined as terrorism, and Arafat was the culprit. Uh, and then in a June uh, 24, 2002 speech, Bush uh, endorsed the idea that uh, there should be regime change in, um, among the Palestinian Authority and that they had to dismantle the, um, uh, the so-called terrorist uh, infrastructure, i.e. what Palestinians see is resistance. Um, the issue fell off of Bush's screen uh, until Tony Blair brought it up. Uh, this resulted in something called the Roadmap, which was released on April 30th, 2003. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas was appointed the Palestinian Prime Minister and replacement for Arafat in nego negotiations. The Roadmap had all the flaws of Madrid Oslo, even as some of its language sounded even-handed. The Palestinians accepted it, uh, feeling they had no other alternative. Ariel Sharon's cabinet uh, accepted it on May 25, 2003, conditioned on 14 amendments uh, designed to effectively stalemate negotiations and preclude the establishment of a viable Palestinian state. Uh, the roadmap called for concurrent and parallel steps. I'm almost finished, honestly. <laughs> just, a, just another page. Uh, the roadmap called for concurrent and parallel steps by Israel and the Palestinian Authority, but Sharon announced two preconditions embodied in his 14 amendments. Palestinians must dismantle the resistance structure, which they call terrorism, as Sharon reminded Bush, he stated in his June 24 speech, before anything else could happen. And second, the Palestinians must renounce the legal refugee right of return. Given that the powerful Israeli uh, army and military in three years has been unable to stop Palestinian resistance, Sharon set an impossible condition for Abbas, made even more impossible because there was no guarantee of a state as an end goal for that process. And given that the refugees make up 70% of the Palestinian population, no leader can renounce that right. It has to be officially recognized by Israel first before compromises become possible. The uh, Israeli lobby and the fundamentalists and uh, various other groups were negative on the roadmap. They focused on the concurrent and parallel steps uh, provision, arguing, as did Sharon, that it was a deviation from Bush's uh, original speech and implied symmetry of blame. Effectively, the roadmap is dead, and so is the two-state solution. Ironically, Israeli actions have killed it and set conditions for a South African solution of one state. Those who continue to advocate for a two-state solution are perhaps unknowingly advocating for a fragmented Bantustan. Presently, uh, Bush is uh, trying to back away from the fantasy land vision and strategy of the neocons without looking like he is. The tough talk to Korea, Syria, and Iran have moderated. Unilateralism, while not abandoned by any means, has given minute slack to diplomacy. It is constricted by Bush's swagger unfortunately. The fall of Baghdad did not bring about the desired automatic reshaping of the Middle East and certainly has not brought the Palestinian-Israeli conflict any closer to expected surrender of Palestinian rights in exchange for a series of untenable autonomous enclaves in the territory. Conclusion. The expectation is that Bush will not pressure Israel to follow the roadmap in its present form, uh, which, like Oslo, is dressed up autonomy at best, Abantustan. And, and would not offer a durable peace in any case. Bush will try to avoid taking action on this conflict until after the elections. Israeli journalist Akiva Elda sums up Bush's present dilemma in an article in Haaretz. Uh, he said, it is certainly not in, in uh, uh, it has no interest, Bush has no interest in his rivals and opponents in the press adding the roadmap to his list of failures. On the other hand, the president's political advisers are afraid that if their boss doesn't find a way to remain on the fence and tries instead to twist Sharon's, uh, Prime Minister Sharon's hands, uh, 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 
he won't uh, hesitate, that is, Sharon won't hesitate to show the American voter who was the real uh, uh, boss in Washington. End, end sentence. The utopian neocons who persuaded Bush to adopt this strategy have generated world hatred of us and given international terrorism a boost, and they have also caused chaos in the Middle East and beyond. Americans are paying a heavy debt for Bush's folly. In the meantime, both Palestinians and Israeli citizens continue to pay a deadly price for the Bush neocons, fundamentalist, and Likudist policies. They have taken the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict out of the range of a two-state solution. Thank you very much. Well, I think... Thank you, Elaine, and I, there's not only food for thought, but I think there will be probably lots of comments and questions on what was um, an exceptionally uh, detailed summary of what we've, of the history of what is uh, a difficult crisis that is affecting, as you suggested, stability in the world. Our uh, final speaker is uh, Jeffrey Taliaferro. He's an assistant professor of political science at Tufts, and he's not only a published author, but he has a forthcoming book, um, and it is called Balancing Risks, Great Power Intervention in the Periphery. If I got that right, Jeffrey? Yes. How's that for a plug, eh? Not bad. No. Uh, and he is going to talk about post-Iraq reconstruction with perhaps some comparisons uh, with uh, post-war reconstruction of Japan and Germany, although I'm losing confidence in my ability to predict what people will say. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Uh, Every year at Tufts University, I'm both a political science professor and I'm also somewhat of a diplomatic historian. Every year at Tufts University, I teach a course called The Rise and the Fall of the Great Powers, which examines how five major states since 1648 have dealt with basic issues in their grand strategy, uh, particularly the problem of dealing with external threats and fighting major wars. And so in order to understand the situation which the United States finds itself in in the wake of 9-11 and in the wake of Operation Iraqi Freedom, I'm going to frame my talk around several historical analogies. Now, analogies, comparisons between present and past events can be illustrative, but it's important to remember that no two events in world history are ever identical. With that said, I'll focus on four themes. First, the extent to which the United States finds itself in a position similar to that of a past great power, Germany, at the turn of the 20th century. Second, I'll talk briefly about the preventive war rationale for going into Iraq and removing Saddam Hussein. And contrary to the conventional wisdom, there is nothing new about preventive war thinking or what the Bush administration mistakenly labels preemption in American strategic thought. Third, I will talk about the false analogy between the post-war reconstruction of Iraq and the American occupations of Germany and Japan after the Second World War, and then I'll conclude with a few brief remarks about the problem of winning in Iraq and what would constitute an exit strategy. What is remarkable about the United States is that we are the first great power in the history of the world to be preponderant in all of the underlying bases of national power, military power, economic power, technology, geography. We have it all and we face no peer competitor, nor will we face a peer competitor in the next 10 to 15 years. Back at the turn of the last century, around the time that my grandmother was born, Germany was the preponderant state in the international system. Germany was the richest state in Europe. It had the fastest growing economy. It surpassed Great Britain as the leading industrial power and as the chief manufacturing and exporting power between 1871 and 1900. 
it had the strongest and most powerful army in Europe. Now, what makes the comparison between Germany at this period and the United States today so remarkable is the fact that both countries did face external threats to their security. And yet, both countries undertook a series of steps which had the effect, sometimes unintended, often unforeseen, of making everyone around them feel terribly insecure. Let me give you a few examples. Beginning around 1900, German leaders were obsessed, obsessed with the growing threat posed by Russia, obsessed with the growing likelihood that Russia would industrialize over the next decade and a half and would modernize its army and could overwhelm Germany. And in the case of the German general staff and officials in the German foreign office, there were frequent conversations about the necessity of launching a preventive war against Russia before it was too late. Similarly, in the wake of the September the 11th terrorist attacks, the mere possibility that some state or a non-state actor might repeat the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center or that some state might acquire weapons of mass destruction, which is a very broad and misleading term because chemical and biological weapons are nowhere near as threatening to the United States as nuclear weapons or radiological weapons. It's very hard to take out an entire city with mustard gas. The mere possibility that so-called rogue states could acquire such weapons and might use them against the United States or might, quote, blackmail the United States. I wonder what that term actually means. Does that mean that you show pictures of people in compromising position uh, with nuclear weapons or what have you? But the mere possibility drove a good deal of the thinking in foreign policy circles in Washington after 9-11. Another comparison between Germany and the United States, in both instances, senior foreign policy officials or a parochial group of individuals who had a somewhat paranoid worldview. I'm talking in particular about Germany's erstwhile Kaiser Wilhelm II and the men who surrounded him after he fired the great Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. What is remarkable about Wilhelm II, who is the poster child for why five generations of close cousins ought not to marry, <laughs> is that he surrounded himself with a remarkable group of extremely mediocre and extremely paranoid men. In particular, his third chancellor, Bernhard von Bülow, and Bülow's chief foreign policy advisor, Friedrich von Holstein, two men who saw threats where none existed and who believed that the best way for Germany to enhance its security was through swagger and bluster, and by provoking international crises, and by building up a German battle fleet, and that would intimidate Britain into being Germany's ally, and that they could coerce Russia into also being Germany's ally at the same time that other parts of the German establishment were talking about a preventive war on Russia. Similarly, in the wake of 9-11, we find that officials in the Bush administration, the so-called neoconservatives, who uh, Professor Hugopian talked about, share a similar type of worldview, that the United States can best enhance its security by demonstrating its willingness to use military force, by repudiating international agreements, and by using force preventively, not preemptively, but preventively, to reshape the domestic orders of other states, and the whole dynamics of other regions, in particular the Middle East. Now, as I said, there is a limit to historical analogies. The United States after 9-11 is certainly not Wilhelmine Germany. The United States enjoys a far greater margin of relative power over its likely competitors in the future than Wilhelmine Germany ever did. Germany's problems lay in the fact that it was at the center of Europe and shared common borders with Russia and France and managed to alienate both of them. Germany managed to find itself in a minority of two in a great power system of five. The United States is in a great power system of one. Germany eventually wound up fighting a destructive war. The United States does not face a destructive world war. The United States certainly does not face that possibility. However, the analogy is quite illustrative for the reasons which I just mentioned. 
The second point which I'd like to make is the Bush administration's or one of the Bush administration's stated rationales for Operation Iraqi Freedom. There are actually several stated rationales, depending on who you listen to, what day of the week, what venue they were speaking in, and what Condi Rice was wearing. <laughs> one of the principal rationales for going to war and removing Saddam Hussein was to preclude the possibility that Saddam Hussein would develop and would or would continue to develop and eventually deploy weapons of mass destruction, specifically chemical and biological weapons. Saddam's nuclear program had largely been halted after the 1991 Gulf War. The Bush administration in October of 2002 published its National Security Strategy of the United States, which is a statement of basic national security goals, which embraced the doctrine of preemption the notion that the United States couldn't wait for threats. As I said in the outset, this was a misnomer. What the United States, or what the Bush administration embraced was the notion of preventive war, which is the use of military force to avert a perceived or a future shift in the balance of power, to prevent threats from becoming crises. Preemption refers to the use of military force to forestall an imminent attack. No one thought the United States was in any danger of imminent attack by Iraq or anybody else. The Bush administration embraced this doctrine, and it was not, contrary to popular belief, a radical departure in U.S. strategic thought. On the contrary, on several occasions, presidents and members of their administration from both political parties gave serious consideration to launching preventive wars on rising adversaries. Yes, I know, I've got three minutes. <laughs> serious consideration. The Truman administration seriously considered launching a preventive war against the Soviet Union in the late 1940s before the Soviet Union acquired an atomic bomb. The Eisenhower administration revisited that option in 1953-1954. The Kennedy and the Johnson administrations considered launching a preventive war to prevent China from acquiring nuclear weapons, and as Representative Edwards noted, the Clinton administration came very close to authorizing preventive military action to prevent North Korea from uh, reprocessing nuclear fuel rods in 1993-1994. Where the Bush administration differs from its predecessors is in two respects. First of all, the Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, and Clinton administrations all considered preventive war. They did not trumpet their intention to launch preventive wars to the immediate world. The Bush administration did and this made other states feel terribly uneasy. The second difference is that in every case, with the exception of North Korea, the targets of intended preventive action were rising great powers, or what were perceived to be rising great powers. Iraq was not a rising great power. Saddam Hussein did not pose the same magnitude of threat as Stalin and even Mao Zedong did, or even Kim Jong-il. The third difference, I know I said there were two, but there are actually three. The third difference, the third difference between the Bush administration and the others is that in every case, officials concluded that the costs of post-war reconstruction vastly or would vastly exceed the perceived security benefits of actually launching a preventive war, and they pulled back. The Bush administration did not make this calculation. Let me conclude and omit my fourth point, but let me conclude by discussing the analogy between the American occupations of Germany and Japan after World War II and the current American occupation of Iraq. Many of the proponents of invading Iraq argued that just as the United States created stable democratic political institutions in post-war Germany, or at least the western half of post-war Germany, and in Japan after World War II, one could do the same thing after one removed Saddam Hussein and purged the Ba'ath Party or other officials associated with his regime. 
They also argued that just as the United States built functioning market economies in those countries, one could do the same thing, and that Iraq would become a beacon of light and democracy and free market economics, and it would enlighten the world and change the whole political dynamics of the Middle East. It ignored one basic problem. Germany and Japan were industrialized economies before the wars. Iraq never was. Germany and Japan still had some semblance of a functioning civil infrastructure and a functioning civil society. Iraq doesn't have that. Germany and Japan had relatively homogeneous populations. Iraq has three major ethnic groups or religious groups the Shiites, the Sunnis, and the Kurds, with a history of grievances. There are problems with reasoning and that, with, analogically. Anyway, thank you for your time, and I welcome your questions. Well, I think all three of our speakers have left us with lots of... Uh, uh, food for thought, and because I cut them off, of course, they, they, I know, have lots left that they would like to say, and that will be triggered by your questions. There's a microphone in the middle. Uh, we have uh, about 20 minutes, and so I would ask you to be brief so we can get in as many questions and comments as possible. And you're allowed to wear a brown paper bag over your head, but I'd prefer if you identified yourselves. And we've got three microphones here, so direct your question at, uh, at one or all of the panelists. Um, well, uh, I'm Reg McKean, and I'm wondering if uh, two short questions, well, it may not, may not be short. Uh, um, I'm wondering if Ms. Hagopian sees any hope of a different policy toward the Middle East from any of the 10 Democratic presidential candidates. I'm wondering, wondering if any of the speakers can suggest how our present work in Iraq can be achieved more smoothly than it now is. Who would like to take that first? Do you want to I'll start take the uh, first question since it was directed to myself. The only uh, presidential candidate that has said anything real about the Middle East has been uh, uh, Dennis uh, 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 Kosunik, and uh, he has adopted the policy of Tikkun, uh, the position of Tikkun, which is a, um, a Jewish organization, liberal, and uh, run by Rabbi Lerner, which basically calls for a two-state solution and some sort of a uh, just settlement for the refugees and so forth. Um, and that is basically the position he's adopted. When, when Dean, Governor Dean, talked about the fact that the U.S. should not take any position on the Middle East, would be sort of even-handed, uh, he was clobbered by the other candidates, especially Lieberman, and uh, by the uh, very pro-Israeli lobby uh, in the United States, and he found himself retracting and fumbling and trying to uh, go back to saying his position is that of Apex. Uh, anyone else want to answer the rest of that? Uh, let me address the second part of the question, since it was, uh, I think, addressed to, to me, uh, which is what could the administration have uh, done, uh, or what could the administration be doing differently in Iraq? And I, I will, you know, repeat, uh, you know, it's very easy to be critical of what the administration is doing in uh, Iraq, but uh, let me repeat what one of my cousins from the Deep South once said, which is, well, you all should have thought of that before you all invaded the damn country. Uh, um, the problem is that having alienated just about everybody, a uh, great power and small state alike, not done any planning for actually putting together a, a competent occupation authority working with uh, existing leaders within Iraq. I, I, when I say existing leaders in Iraq, I don't mean Ahmed Chalabi, the neocon stooge. Um, I'm very kind in calling him the neocon stooge. Um, I, I don't mean that. Um, you know, what was remarkable about this occupation and what, what was different between the German and the Japanese occupations for three years before Germany and Japan surrendered, there were working groups within the State Department and the War Department who planned 
how the United States was going to about, go about demilitarizing the country, trying war criminals, rebuilding infrastructure, getting in humanitarian supplies, etc. None of that took place in the case of Iraq. And so the best that the Bush administration or any future administration could do at this point, in my view, amounts to little more than triage. Um, given that we are uh, part of the purpose of the discussion is to talk about what, uh, what should we do in the world, uh, and given that the situation in, uh, is, is imperfect and, and, and you feel the U.S. shouldn't have got in, uh, to Iraq, that doesn't. Yeah, I know it doesn't help. It doesn't. No. It doesn't, doesn't help us at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, just, uh, just for the record, also there are genuine conservatives in the world, and not everybody's a neocon. Next. Another difference with Germany, as I understand it, is that the goal was to destroy Germany. I mean, for three years after the war. There wasn't an effort to rebuild or to humanitarian purposes. It was to starve Germany. As I've read the history, it was almost the Morgenthau Plan, a modified version, but it was not to rebuild Germany until it became an ally in the Cold War. But my question is, I wonder how each of you would respond to a quotation that I have here by Henry Kissinger in his book, Diplomacy, in 1994, page 17. He says, America's journey through the... International politics has been a triumph of faith over ex experience. Since the time America entered the arena of world politics in 1917, it has been so preponderant in strength that this century's major international agreements have been embodiments of American values. And he goes on to list about 20 of them, uh, uh, including the UN. And it has now brought America face to face with the kind of world it had been seeking to avoid throughout its history, and for the first time, the United States can neither withdraw from the world nor dominate it. It seems to me that that is a very uh, pessimistic view, but it looks like reality to me. I wondered if, what, how you would all respond to Henry Kissinger's view in 1994. I'm going to ask Congressman Edwards to start, since he has not uh, had a question yet. <laughs> Besides, well, I like asking him to start. Yeah, well, per first of all, I hope at some point uh, the others on the panel will tell me what they think the word neocon means. You know, <laughs> since uh, I, I, I don't see any relationship to what I understand it to mean. But, uh, you know, I, I think Kissinger was known for, you know, a policy of extreme realpolitik, you know, uh, it was not – his policies were not particularly guided by uh, moral concerns or by human rights concerns. I mean, you know, they, they were strictly, you know, power concerns. Uh, you know, the United States uh, will have we, – we, we don't have the kind of dominance, you know, that he might have envisioned because uh, Europe is getting its active. We, we are certainly the strongest of, of all the players. Uh, but we're not strong enough to, you know, run the world by ourselves. And it's going to be increasingly uh, likely that uh, China, which is getting, you know, much, much stronger, much richer, uh, Europe, uh, when it brings itself into a, as a continent, continental entity rather than various national entities, you know, will be, in fact, offsetting factors. So, um, I, you know, I always find Kissinger interesting, but, uh, you know, that's, that's as far as I'd go. But I guess my question was, aren't, isn't the future of American foreign policy burdened by a terrible past century of for, American foreign policy? It, that was really what I was driving at, and well, I think what Kissinger is saying. Well, it depends how far back you want to go. I mean, you want to go, to 18, years. That's you want to go back to 1898 and, and Cuba? Yes. I mean, you know, it's kind of, yeah. uh, uh, sure, we've, we've made mistakes like everybody else. If, if, I might, if I might add in, I mean, you did quote from the Holy Book, and uh, I, I would largely you know agree. Book. I would largely agree with with what, what Kissinger wrote, and I would go so far as to say one of the things that Kissinger and other self-described realists, and I consider myself to be a realist, uh, say is that there is this peculiar tendency in the United States among policymakers of both polit main political parties to 
deal with the world as they want it to be instead of dealing with the world as it actually is, and to assume that American values are universal values and that America always has benign intentions and that everybody of goodwill would obviously see that the United States has benign intentions. And this is the principal foreign policy legacy of people like Woodrow Wilson. And it has caused unbelievable suffering and unbelievable grief for the United States ever since. Bismarck once said that there's a special providence which uh, guides the affairs of fools and the United States of America. And there is something uh, uh, to be said uh, for that. There is definitely something to be said for that. But I wanted to briefly get back. I know I'm running on tangent, but I want to briefly get back to something you said the first, the first part of your, uh, of your uh, question, which was concerning post-war Germany. Actually, the Roosevelt and the Truman administrations were very concerned about Germany because they realized that Germany was the key to the balance of power in Europe after the war. The Morgenthau plan was never went anywhere. It never went anywhere because Secretary of War Henry Stimson, Morgenthau's principal antagonist in the Roosevelt administration, said this is just the stupidest thing I've ever heard and leaked it to the New York Times. So leaks sometimes do serve a valuable national security purpose and do serve America's long-term interests. But uh, there was never uh, an effort by the United States to thoroughly di dismantle and dismember uh, Germany. It was only after we couldn't get a settlement with the Soviets that we decided better to have two Germanys than to have a single neutral one that could tip the balance of power against us. May I just add one thing, too, that uh, Kissinger was well aware of the fact that the American public had been so attuned to a kind of Wilsonian, uh, at least idealistic position, we know that Wilson wasn't that idealistic, uh, that um, every kind of action we've taken, uh, we prefer for the American public consumption to put it in moral terms, to put it in human rights terms, and that's just not uh, true. And so uh, in many ways, Bush was following through with that by saying, well, not only is it a threat, but we're going to build democracy and we're for human rights and we got rid of a tyrant, et cetera. And this is highly motivating uh, to uh, the American uh, public. Uh, next, please. At the beginning, uh, <clears throat> Congressman Edwards laid out a very nice summary of what foreign policy is for and what it does. I'd like to ask Professor Hagopian how successful Israel's foreign policy is in protecting the interests of Israel, assuming that Professor Edwards has it right. And as a supplement, I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. McDougall what Canada's policy in the Palestine-Israel situation is. Well, let me uh, try to answer that very briefly. Uh, I think Israel's foreign policy in terms of the Middle East and uh, in general, but uh, Palestinian in particular, has, uh, has really uh, been successful only in the use of force in, in keeping uh, Israel the way it is. It's been unsuccessful, unsuccessful in getting uh, itself uh, normalized in the Arab world in the sense of having some justice towards the Palestinians. That's the route to normalization and to good, stable relationships in Israel. Israel is there to stay. This is not an issue. Um, so I think that the, the main problem is uh, Israel's policy. You know there was a debate between uh, Ben-Gurion and Sharat uh, over uh, what should be Israel's policy towards the Arabs. Ben-Gurion argued for force, that, that the only successful way to deal with Arabs and to make them to swallow us and, and accept us uh, and what has happened to Palestine is the use of force. Diane also said that. Sherrod had wanted to try diplomacy. He wasn't against the use of force, but he wanted to try diplomacy. And at that time, Nasser was interested in diplomacy. Diane, said, Diane uh, argued against this because he said, if you go into diplomacy with the Arabs, that means that, uh, and this was before 67, of course, that means that we would have to define our borders and that we have not yet finished our, our process. As you know, Israel has never had any defined borders. Its present borders are ceasefire lines. So I think it really works against it. I think with minimal justice, that was part of the original two-state solution that was made possible first in 1988 and then later under Oslo. Uh, if it had actually been for a two-state solution, 
and really, um, as Peace Now had argued, to get out of the occupied territories, I think that things would have fallen into place for Israel with much more normal relationships with the Arab world. Um, Canada has, uh, first of all, over the years, has played a peacekeeping role in between Israel and Palestine, a very active peacekeeping role. We had a lot of troops there for quite a while, which we don't anymore. Um, it, and essentially throughout that period, it was, uh, it was relatively neutral as a result of that role that it played. Uh, and Canada sees itself very much in that peacekeeping dimension in terms of, of uh, dealing with the Middle East. We, were, um, we are not players on, 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 on the major part of the file. We just simply aren't. We're not big enough. We're not uh, – it's not um, – I won't say we're not relevant, but we, you know, it's not a foul that, that we can have anything like the influence or the, the, the power that the U.S. can. And therefore, uh, it's, it's, that peacekeeping role was probably the best one we could do. We were active players briefly during the Madrid, uh, Madrid uh, process. I was the minister at the time, James Baker. Uh, led it, and, uh, but we were not part of the uh, trying to define the borders or dealing with any of the really difficult issues. We were dealing with some of the social issues and bringing both sides together. The policy now on the part of this government uh, has been moving away from being uh, neutral and, and slightly, maybe slightly pro-Israel to being uh, more pro-Palestinian, and, and they've been a little more outspoken on some of the steps that Israel is going to have to take if they want, if they want peace and secure borders. Next. I wanted to uh, thank you for your acknowledgement of Edward Said and, and um, your nice summary and informative summary of the um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It was very insightful. Um, I wanted to know if people could comment about this is um, an election year coming up. We have, it seems like we don't have enough troops to do the job that we originally intended. The American public may not have the stomach to fund long term uh, the, the costs associated with this guerrilla war. Um, how how uh, successful have we been in our uh, oil policy and um, how is this going to impact our relationship with Saudi Arabia? and um, the Afghanistan oil, the Iraqi oil, and the Halliburton contracts, and do we have the stomach to build the infrastructure to get that oil? I'm not sure we'll be able to cover all of that question, but I'll go down the panel one at a time, maybe to take a stab. Elaine, do you want to start no, I, I briefly, I, I, everyone? I, 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 I think uh, uh, Bush knows he's in a mess, and uh, the Congress certainly is acting very strongly and asking questions about that $87 uh, million, as well as the uh, $20 million that are supposed to be directly for reconstruction, which are going to a lot of Bush's uh, buddies. Um, uh, there was a man uh, uh, from the uh, American Enterprise on NPR this morning, uh, or maybe it was this afternoon, and <clears throat> he was arguing that $87 million is nothing, and it's not going to really affect us, and we, you know, we, you know, it's, it, it may, well, maybe we could buy a few Boeing airplanes or do something about education. But, of course, the American Enterprise Institute is part of the neocon system. So one would expect that, whereas others who came on before were arguing that this is a total disaster, and Congress, for once, is acting up and wanting some accountability. So I think that we have made a mess uh, over there, and we have made a very, very difficult situation for our future generations in this country uh, with that huge deficit. Uh, second, I think that any, um, any Democrat who comes into power, and I'll vote for anyone, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> even if I, and I don't like any of the candidates in particular, uh, but uh, they are going to be stuck with Iraq. They're going to be stuck with Iraq. They're going to be stuck with the, uh, the rage that has uh, grown in the Palestinian-Israeli issue. They are going to be stuck with uh, the whole Arab Muslim world uh, hating us. And they cannot, uh, because of the way American foreign policy formulates, change our policy so rapidly. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the only thing that would uh, work in that area, uh, any area, is that we're seen as fomenting justice of some minimal justice. 
Well, we're not about to do that because we have too much uh, interest in controlling that area. And finally, let me just say that <clears throat> if you look at uh, if you look at the study that Rand did on China, uh, it, 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 it talks about and it was and it was uh, Zalmay Khalidat who did it. Uh, talks about the need to, uh, you know, be, be concerned about China and depriving it of uh, oil resources. So if you look at the whole picture in the, in the Middle East and Central Asia, that's what we're trying to do. If I, okay, if I could, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> there is no Afghan oil. The oil in Iraq is not going to get to market in sufficient quantities until 2006, 2007, and Iraq's occupation will not be self-financing. And our long-term prospects in Iraq are very abysmal. I agree with Professor Hogopian. Whomever becomes president on January the 20th, 2005, is going to be stuck with Iraq. Once great powers intervene in peripheral regions, it is extraordinarily difficult for them to pull out. Yeah, I, I, I agree. This is something that's going to last a long time. Um, how well it uh, wins the support of Congress or the people is going to depend an awful lot on what success we have in developing actual infrastructure and uh, that includes governmental in infrastructures in other ways that we can turn over the management of the country to the Iraqis themselves. Uh, we will obviously have to continue to put money in there, uh, but it's going to have to be something that allows the American people and the Congress to see that it is having an effect that the President says it will uh, toward stability, toward de building democracy. Uh, and, and the other issue that, that is uh, lying in wait is I think there is an increasing uh, feeling in the Congress and in the country uh, that something is going to have to be done about Saudi Arabia, too, and, and getting the Saudis uh, to uh, democratize, uh, to uh, uh, have more respect for human rights, because that remains a real sore point, you know, the fact that we have built our alliances with a country uh, that has the policies the Saudis have. Uh, we have five minutes left. We have three questioners. I'm going to, and uh, I won't take anyone else in the line, please. Um, so could we be very brief? My question is primarily for Lane Hagopian, but I'd welcome response from the other two panelists also. Um, Elaine, I know many, um, both activists and scholars, who share your analysis, although I haven't heard it put so succinctly uh, and so well by anybody else up until now. Um, but where people differ very often is in terms of why does the U.S. do what it does vis-a-vis -vis Israel, Palestine. And people who very often share the analysis have very divergent views on whether it, whether Israel is running the show in effect or whether the U.S. is doing what it's doing out of its own perceived self-interest and it just and when APEC and company appear to be powerful it's only because they are pushing policies that are perceived to be in the US self-interest so I wonder if you'd speak to that I think what I'll do is I'll ask the next two questioners to put the question and then we'll have the three answer the questions all at once next please <clears throat> um, my question is um, directed to the panel in general and it is um, it is established that the US wants a more stable world and yet, can it really expect to achieve this if it continues to act unilaterally, thereby promoting instability? Yeah, I'll, try to, I'll try to make mine as briefly as possible, but uh, Mr. Gopian, you know, you refer to the occupied territories in Israel. You know, to give a little perspective, this, the entire country of the United States is an occupied territory. But what, what, uh, and also, you referred to Nasser almost as, as if he were a peace-loving person who was, was willing to make a deal with Israel. I found that I find that rather strange. But Arif, to me, it seems Arafat is the big problem. He is the sole reason that they that they can't make a deal. But and I know Sharon is is no good either. But I want to know what was wrong with the Barack deal that was offered during the you know the la in the last days of the Clinton administration. It seemed to me that the uh, the Palestinians were offered a state, they were offered a sharing of Jerusalem, and you have to also recognize, too, that even though you may refer to them as occupied territories, the Israelis have a histor a, an historical claim on all of these territories that predates the time that the, uh, that the Palestinians came in. 
Uh, could I have, I know this is going to be very difficult, but could I have <laughs> brief responses from the panel? Uh, has, 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 uh, shall I just take my two questions uh, yes, first? Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, uh, Israel actually became very important to the United States uh, in uh, uh, in the 1967 war, even before that, 1966, one of the spokesmen for the uh, uh, foreign affairs recognized that the United States was tied down in Vietnam and that Nixon um, was looking around. It's a Nixon codicil that where you find someone else to, you give them the... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the sort of the hose and water, and they put out local fires. Uh, the U.S. was very hostile to uh, Nasser and Arab nationalism, which uh, had the audacity to say they wanted to have their full independence and have equal uh, relationships with the U.S., but not to be dominated by it or have an alliance uh, with it. And from that point on, Israel, uh, especially when it crushed Nasser in the 1967 war, became a strategic asset. Uh, whether um, uh, one wants to talk about the, I, I don't want to talk a lot about the pro-Israeli lobby. It is strong. Uh, does it determine American foreign policy? Um, I don't, I won't say that it does. Uh, because the U.S. found Israel in its interest at that time when it was attempting to contain the Soviet Union, contain Arab nationalism, and uh, that was our policy. Whether it was right or wrong um, is not relevant at this time, but it was the way in which we saw it, our government saw it, and so Israel became important. Israel becomes more uh, predominant with th this Bush administration because those who are in power are people who have uh, very much supported uh, Israel and the Likud policy. And therefore, the, um, given the fact also that the fundamentalists for their own, uh, and I would say originally anti-Semitic reasons, uh, support the state of Israel, hoping that eventually it will go to Armageddon and then the rest of the Jews will become Christians. That's their reason for supporting Israel. They brought those all together, and uh, in that sense then, uh, they were able to sustain uh, a kind of position which the U.S. had basically favored under Clinton and under Bush and so forth. So that uh, that's that source. The, as for the uh, occupied territory, uh, I would agree with you that the uh, U.S., of course, is a, uh, a colonial settler state. Uh, so is Australia, so is Canada, et cetera. Um, I very much favor the rights of, of Native Americans. Um, Unfortunately, the international law and the kinds of uh, law that have grown since then uh, and in a more complicated world uh, did not govern us at that time. Now, uh, the historic rights of Israel to the occupied territories is based uh, on the uh, biblical uh, uh, thing. And uh, I think it's important to note that uh, while there are these ties that people uh, do feel to that land, and I am not saying that they don't feel those ties, uh, this doesn't negate the fact that the Bible does not serve as the determinant of international law. Uh, and it, what we have is that uh, it is occupied territory uh, and that that is recognized by the rest of the world except for uh, Israel and to some extent the United States uh, uh, up until recently. Uh, uh, and then the Barak deal, while it was proclaimed as, uh, and, and, and there's PR all over the, this country, and it was proclaimed as a great deal. In fact, if you really look at closely, what we, we finally could get something down, uh, and Robert Malley wrote about this, et cetera, and others, it was basically uh, uh, four enclaves that were cut across. I mean, one enclave would be Gaza, <clears throat> and we know that 40% <clears throat> of that is uh, uh, basically filled with settlements, and that the rest of the West Bank would be cut by uh, bypass roads, uh, by the settlements, by the electrical grid and the water resources tied into Israel uh, controlling uh, the area. Uh, the, the whole terms of it would have been that the borders would not have been uh, sovereign to the, the uh, uh, Palestinians, that uh, in essence they would still have to get permission and for most of their economic transitions, uh, uh, transactions through through I'm, Israel. I'm going to have to ask yeah, that sorry. So that that's because that's, yeah. I realize that's a very complicated. It is. Question. It's very complicated. Uh, Jeffrey uh, next, and then final word to Mickey. 
Very briefly, uh, in answer to the gentleman in the blue in the very back, uh, the United States has acted unilaterally in the past. It will continue to act unilaterally in the future. Other great powers have done the same. Unilateralism and multilateralism are a continuum. The question is whether the United States acts, pursues unilateral policies that are based on calculations of relative power and not on abstract notions of ideal forms of government in other societies. Uh, that, to me, is the real question. Second, with respect to the first part of the gentleman's question regarding uh, the United States and Israel, this is not my particular area of interest, but it seems to me that part of the problem that the United States is having is that the alliance, the quasi-alliance with Israel did serve a very strategic purpose during the Cold War, but that strategic rationale has since ended. Uh, and currently, given domestic politics in the United States for the reasons that Professor Hagopian uh, discussed, we will not have a comprehensive, detailed, and honest debate in this country about the Middle East, about U.S. relations with Israel or the Palestinian Authority. It will not happen. No president is willing to touch the third rail of uh, a foreign policy and deal with that issue constructively. The one president who was willing to do so was George Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. It's, it's sort of hard at the very end to introduce anything uh, controversial, but uh, <laughs> however, I, you know, it, I, I would like to make a comment or two about definition. Um, unilateralism. Uh, to, to def I, you know, there, there are lots of questions that could legitimately be raised about the U.S. action in Iraq, but to call our action unilateral is a slur on Spain, Italy, Poland, Britain, Australia, uh, you know, uh, France, Germany, and Russia do not a, a world make. Uh, and while there were a lot of countries that did not support what we did, what we did was not unilateral. It was multilateral. It was just not, you know, all-encompassing of all nations. So, so the, the use of the word unilateral is very uh, unfortunate. The other thing, I, I have to respond, uh, Elaine, uh, as a Jewish conservative, and probably, I think, speaking for other Jewish conservatives like, David Brudnoy, Jeff Jacoby, Bill Crystal, Irving Crystal, Norman Pedoritz, Midge Dechter, the so-called neocons, you know, Pearl Wolf. You know, we're talking about a group, the, the suggestion that there is something anti-Semitic, you know, in, in, and, and a hope that somehow this policy of, of supporting Israel is going to cause them, uh, cause people to become Christian is really an absurd Statement. No, I didn't say that. You know, I, I mean, just you know. said that the fundamentalists, right, the, the fundamental. fundamentalists who support Israel, make no bones about the fact that they they have come they around do. to a different that, that no, they no. that they, they support it because of this kind of they, they, they're they, true believers. They support it well, because well, anyway, they, not they, they, su <laughs> they support it because of their beliefs in, the, in a democracy in the Middle East. No, I don't. Uh, I, 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 wait, wait, just, wait I, let me finish I, one I, point. If I might, if I might I want, I want to finish one point. They don't even believe in democracy in the United States. I there is one. Well, I mean that's. You know, let, let me start by, by you know, just uh, when Israel crushed Nasser. I thought Nasser attacked Israel. No, he did not. It was uh, a preemptive strike. Uh, it well, was, was true, okay, it was the one true, right, true okay. instance that, of preemption because strike. Israelis no. knew that they, as they were, Egypt, Egyptian Syrian attack was imminent. That's right, absolutely. Imminent. Im right. I mean, you know. Um, countries have a right to defend themselves and to defend their people, and Israel has tried to do that. Let me just. Let uh, me, uh, well, do you have we'll a continue. final more point, Mickey? No, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>